Hello again, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Deidre Guy, and I am the president and founder of the IWSCC, or Inclusive Workplace and Supply Council of Canada. What we do is we certify veteran and disabled business owners, veteran and or disabled business owners as uh, diverse suppliers in Canada, and we do our best to get them networking with large corporations to help build their business and build some intergenerational wealth. So I uh, thank you once again for being here. Um, our show today is produced by Pod Supply, and if you're watching this on YouTube, then uh, our ASL interpretation has been sponsored by RBC Royal Bank. They are our ASL uh, leader for 2023, and supplied by Maple Communications Canada. And I'm so excited today because I get to do a, a, a chat with two of my friends. One, uh, Julie Caldwell, who I've known for quite some time from the beginning of an organization called Canadian Accessibility Network. That's how I met her. Uh, so happy about that, and. Tara Connolly, who I've gotten to know in the last year as we've worked together on some research and just loving her sense of humor. Both of them, I really enjoy spending time with them. And we're actually starting this podcast late because we couldn't stop chatting about other things. So here we are finally on camera. So welcome both of you, Julie and Tara. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I just want you to you know, tell us a little bit about who you are and sort of what you do right now work-wise. And uh, Tara, do you want to start? Sure. Well, uh, so I'm lucky enough to spend time talking with you today because I get to work um, at uh, Carleton University's Accessibility Institute. Uh, and my role there is that of um, the research and development, uh, the assistant director of research and development. And that means I get to spend a lot of time in the variety of projects uh, that we are working on and the research we're doing related to accessibility. Uh, so that's one of the really, the great pieces of the work that I get to engage in. Um, my background is actually one, well, I, you know, I can tell you about that later if we talk about that, but it, what, you know, what helps is that I've kind of got an education and counseling background as well, and I've been working in accessibility and inclusion for many years. So it's really cool to get to um, work at the Accessibility Institute because we look at a, the field of accessibility. There's so many entry points into the field of accessibility. Uh, and that's what the projects kind of give us is uh, um, when we talk about them later, I can tell you a bit about them. They're in all sorts of different levels and, and um, ways of thinking about accessibility. So all in the yeah, area of accessibility. Julie, so yeah. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so all, you, all your research you're doing is in the area of accessibility. Indeed, that's yeah. got to be so cool. That's yeah, and some so of it's cool. more applied. Some of, well, actually, most of it is applied. We're about kind of looking at projects uh, that really are uh, both going to be on the ground, and even when they're more academic, they're to to serve the as fuel for people who are yeah. doing the active work. Beautiful. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's got to be really rewarding when you see. Yeah, and we get, you know, like we often, will, it's very important to us at the Accessibility Institute that we sort of uh, note that we get to like a live, work and play in sort of uh, a space that's really important to us. It's the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin peoples. Mm. And for us, we've been really doing a lot of work around it's the land acknowledgement is really important to say, but it's really about our actions. Uh, yes. That's going to really kind of start to generate that. That's part of inclusive community as well. And mm -hmm. so that inclusion piece ends up being pretty important to us. Yeah, I love that. I love the way you put that together. Julie, I see that your internet's been a bit tricky. Are you here with us now? I am here. I'm here. You are good. Okay. So uh, tell us who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Deidre. I'm really excited to, to be here and a part of your podcast today. Uh, my official role at the Accessibility Institute is Assistant Director Operations. Um, and But that really means that I get to have my hands in all of the different types of things that we do. And as Tara said, uh, you know, a, a good portion of our work is around applied research and accessibility. And so uh, I get the opportunity to help uh, build the teams that come into these different projects and to support their um, success uh, from beginning right through to end and proposal development, all that fun stuff. And we also do a fair bit of work in uh, moving moving into more into education and training as well in some of the areas that we're focused on. Um, so I, I have the, the great pleasure of being involved in all things that we do. Uh, and that's pretty exciting for me. Yeah, that would be. Uh, it's, especially if you're like, I am a nosy and you just want to know everything that's going on. Like just, <laughs> you know, I don't necessarily have to do it. I just want to know about it. And, you know, I like throw in a suggestion here and there. That's like, that's my goal in life for work. <laughs> 
So what led you both to the work that you're doing now? Sometimes we talk to people and it's uh, because they live with a disability, for example, is the reason they want to be in the accessibility world, mm-hmm. or they, they're they a caregiver for a parent or a child with a disability. Um, so so Tara, what led you to to working at the Accessibility Institute and having that, that interest? How long do we have? Do I get to tell the whole full story? Um, Well, so to be quite honest, don't be scared. I will talk about when I was younger. Uh, When I was a kid, I was sort of just naturally drawn to uh, maybe, you know, the notion of inclusion. Right. Frankly, and that just sort of spoke to my my little soul, my little spirit. Um, But you know, I feel like I can check a lot of those boxes when you were saying the reasons why people get involved. Um, and I would suggest that anyone out there listening, at some point in your life, you're going to be checking one of those boxes, yeah. whether that's caregiving or personal lived experience, um, about how you why accessibility becomes important, right? Yeah. Uh, but for me, it was sort of a early on, um, sort of gravitating to some of that work. Uh, then I became a teacher and I was a, mm. I, I specifically took a course, I took my teaching degree in inclusive education. I wanted to be a a teacher in inclusive. I wanted any student to be able to come into my class should they want to. And um, so I trained that way. Um, And then I, so my background is counseling and education. So inclusive education, I'm very steeped in those kind of practices, inclusive practices for education, but also within the counseling side, um, I, I noted that, you know, there was a lot of folks who were not able to actually access counseling and, and really yeah. uh, mental health supports that were meaningful for them and spoke to their lived experience of whether that's disability related barriers that they're navigating or just what their realities were. Um, and so for actually quite a long time now, it's over, I am that old, yikes, <laughs> uh, over 20 years now, I've been uh, a counselor who a lot of my work has focused on working with neurodivergent individuals and kind of co-creating transitions uh, that are meaningful and kind of on their own terms, right? Uh, for people, uh, particularly, I've focused on kind of adults too, because we we don't necessarily have enough for our young ones and youth. But uh, I would say we we also forget about aging, right? Mm-hmm. We forget that we, our lived experiences of something don't necessarily go away as we age. So yeah, um, that's what brought me. So all of that cumulative thing, uh, my transitions. I focused on transitions into post-secondary and I did work in academic accommodations office as well at post-secondary level. And then I had a really unique opportunity to develop um, a support for students, um, particularly those uh, who are trying to get support for their transitions into post-secondary. Okay. So that's what kind of then led me to the Accessibility Institute. So for anyone out there who's saying like, what job or what, what do I have to take in order to become that? I would say, you know what? Continue to do work that that speaks to inclusion in whatever work you're right. doing. And yeah. that leads you to this kind of, there's mm-hmm. not sort of a, yes, there's some degrees that bring you closer to accessibility expertise, but I would say it's a lot of living and working and, and creating and solution finding in whatever realm you're in. That's what's going to bring you to this kind of accessibility field. I, to- I totally agree, because if you take a look at my work history, I, I always had, you know, an attitude of inclusion, uh, but nothing was related to accessibility and certainly not supplier diversity. In fact, I first learned about it uh, only like nine, 10 years ago and had no idea what those two words put together even meant. So, <laughs> so you just never know what you're going to stumble into. Uh, Julie, what's led you to the work that you're doing now with, uh, well, with Accessibility Institute? Yeah, so I am actually a longtime employee of Carleton University, and in my early years, part of the first half of my career, uh, I worked in the Central Career Services uh, Office in a number of different roles, and so I actually have a background and a real passion for employment. And uh, okay. about five years ago, give or take, uh, around this time of year, uh, I had a knock on my door from somebody that I worked with in my early years on campus from the Palmetto Center for Students with Disabilities. And uh, they had shared with me that there was an opportunity coming up that they had applied for some funding for a really amazing applied research project, which was looking at um, employment of post-secondary students with disabilities. And, you know, would I be interested in being involved in something that could potentially have this, you know, across Canada and greater impact in the work that was being done? Um, so I took what I call my a sabbatical from the job I was in at the time in the Sprott School of Business. I had been in a number of different roles there. 
And, uh, and that is how I came to the Institute. So I actually don't have a background in disability okay. uh, in any formal way, shape or form, but I have a real passion for employment. Uh, and I have to say that I've just become, uh, you know, really um, uh, informed and uh, become a real advocate in this, uh, in my journey uh, with the Accessibility Institute and still learning, have a long way to go, but really feel honored to be a part of the projects and the work that we're doing and the impact that's coming from some of that work. And I would say my experience with you is that you have a very inclusive mind, like an inclusive mindset. Like when we have meetings and stuff, you're often the one that is, thinks about that other person or that other thing that, you know, that like, I just see you going, yes, but let's not forget these folks and let's not, oh, and you, did you get everything you need to say in, you know what I mean? Like you're just one of those people that I think likes to, to put people together. So Deidre, I think you actually make a really important point there too. While there's definitely some content expertise that is important that we can develop around accessibility, I think the like some of the initial pieces to engaging with accessibility as a field and as work is to have that inclusive mindset mm -hmm. and an understanding of you know inclusivity in its all ways, shapes, or forms. Like that's that's the entry point to the discussion. I think for me around accessibility, right? That it's that we are thinking that we, we consider all sorts of different ways and means that all of us are going to work together, participate together, play together, be together. Uh, and that's, that's the important foundational point. So I, I love that we actually just talked about that because while, you know, understanding and having content expertise is very important. Like I've, you know, mm -hmm. I've worked to develop it over years too. Like it's, I'm not dismissing it, but it's, it's, um, I, I think what really helps us have these conversations and continue them and making movement forward in any area around accessibility is that that idea of an inclusive mindset to begin with. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So talking about all the different work in, uh, in the areas of accessibility, uh, an area of accessibility that hadn't occurred to me uh, up until four or five years ago was accessible procurement um, and all the things surrounding how to make the procurement process more accessible. Uh, there's, I think, two paths to go down in this thought process and, and probably more, um, but certainly accessible procurement in terms of how is your process for purchasing from people? Is it accessible? But also, what is it that you're buying and how are you buying things and are they accessible and are you doing that in an accessible way? So we have done some work together for the last year or so on accessible procurement. So it's, it's, um, well, Carleton University, uh, I guess Accessibility Institute really, as well as Adaptability Canada, which, uh, if you've seen in some of our earlier podcasts, we interviewed Jeff Wilson from there that's working on this research as well with us and IWSCC uh, on accessible procurement, which is something that a lot of people are talking about right now. Uh, and so, it, you know, we're hearing about it all over the place. Um, so, Julie, I just, I, you know, in that area of accessible research, I just want to ask you, um, share a little bit about your part in the study that we're doing, yours specifically, as well as Accessibility Institute, and any kind of insights or, or you know, fun facts, any, anything that had to do with your experience in the research project uh, that you found. Yeah, we're talking about the procurement project, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, I haven't been as immersed in it as Tara has, but I, uh, my background is in business. And so when this opportunity came up to do this collaboration with Adaptability Canada and IWSCC, um, it was just a really natural um, uh, fit for me to be a part of the conversation and to uh, learn more and understand the accessible piece of it. As you said, it's something that I wasn't even really thinking about either. And so it's, uh, I've had a, a bit more of a supporting role, I guess you could say, in some of the work. And, and really at the end of the day, Tara, um, had sort of the lead role in driving that particular project on behalf of the Institute. So Tara, maybe you want to speak to, um, some of the actual work that got done in that project. <laughs> Sure. And we can riff off of this because, like, you know, I think that's one area where, Julie, you bring a lot of insight, uh, particularly from your background in employment and business, you know, being able to sort of speak to what some of the realities are out there in, you know, in the field as well. Um, you know, a few of the things we engaging in this project, I found it really it's 
the thing I love the most about the role is that I get to learn more about all sorts of things, transportation, procurement, like I, and it really speaks to the geek in me. Like I'm a bit of a, <laughs> I, I love to learn. I love to learn. And uh, especially in an area that's already special interest for me. So uh, around the procurement, per- procurement thing, uh, what we found in our research uh, was that, first of all, we're, we're sort of at a really unique time right now where the interests of the business community around remaining nimble, because they've just gone through yeah. like, ooh, what happens to yeah. our, our supply chains and what happen, what, what's going on based on what happened with the pandemic, they're realizing that nimbleness needs to be there for them. That's um, one also, of the reasons, if I can interrupt, that's one of the reasons why we saw so much more interest in doing business with small businesses. And we saw, while, while we saw a lot of small businesses not uh, generate as much revenue, we saw others that were able to pivot really do quite well. And that's because of that nimbleness that the large animal organizations weren't able to have uh, within their yeah. supply chain. So, so sorry, that's Tara, right. I just wanted to interrupt with, Whoa, just wanted to interrupt you. <laughs> that's totally cool. No, no, I think that's what I love about conversations like this, right? Like one, one thing begets another. Well, and so, yes, so in that unique opportunity in time right now that we're seeing is that, yes, there's that need to be nimble, to be able to pivot, as, as you said. And one of the ways to do that is to have a very rich and diverse um, vendors within your supply chain and drawing on on things and, and being mindful as well that what those vendors are creating is also accessible because that leads to the next piece, which is generationally, there is more pressure from consumers, particularly the younger ones coming up to say, I want you as a business to be mindful of sustainability, yeah. our planet, our people are like, there, there needs to be, it's going past just good corporate citizenship and into yeah. like, be accountable to us as investors, either investors yeah. in funds or consumers. And so that's another piece that comes together with the have to be nimble. People are asking for this as well. And because of that, it speaks to the bottom line that in past where there's been pushback on, well, okay, yes, this is a good idea in in essence or in, you know, there's a moral value to this, but does it make good business sense? Yeah, it does. Mm. And those are all kind of, I feel, that's one thing we saw is that they're kind of colliding in a, in a time right now. So it makes good sense. And it is at a time where people are having to rethink what they're doing regardless. So it's a good time to have that conversation of what the strengths would be in having an accessible procurement process, both in what you're buying and and what you're bringing in, but also are, is your is your process for of procurement actually accessible to the people you want even doing the work of procurement? Yeah, you have various bodies and minds and and ways of thinking that are going to help you create a process that's going to be innovative as well. So your part of the study was uh, more research on the technical aspects of procurement. Was that is that fair to say? Essentially, yeah, okay. yeah, and also looking at what's the seamless connectivity. Um, you know our. And also checking out to see, you know, what, what's being written about procurement as well. Okay. We also were really lucky because we've got a really engaged procurement group at our university nice. as well, who have really, they're really keen to be going beyond compliance and even and grappling with what does it mean to be compliant even with the rules and, and pieces that are coming out. So, yeah. Um, so that's been helpful, I'd say, on Julian Mai's part, being involved with this project, because we also get to involve, be involved with um, seeing it on the ground in our own uh, organization and what those folks are grappling with and wanting to be able to provide as good um, procurement service to an organization and a large one. I had someone say to me uh, a number of years ago in the area of the accessibility for the built environment, so accessible buildings, and he said, um, you know, building a building to code or, or, you know, being compliant with your building is just building the shittiest building the government will allow you to do. <laughs> and I was like, that is a very good point. Maybe roughly put, but a very good point. Like that mm-hmm. is it. And I think when people start to look at that, well, let's be compliant. Okay. By being compliant, you're just being at the, the lowest level that you can possibly be. Like, why do you want to shoot for the bottom, you know, and to do what's easiest. So did you, did you run across any interesting things, any interesting experiences? or bits of information that you gleaned from the research that you did. Now, this study will be coming out for public view, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. but just wondering if either of you have any kind of uh, little tidbits you can share, any spoilers? 
I'll let Tara speak to that. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you had said to me a few years ago, you're going to be speaking to someone about procurement, I, I, I would have been like, mm, I don't think I am. <laughs> However, it's a reminder that actually inclusive practice, inclusive design, the field of accessibility is touching everything. Like I get really excited about the field of accessibility. It's really, it's evolving and growing and really um, there's a strengthening of it. Um, and there's so many different ways to speak about it, right? Yes. So it used to be, yeah. if you were talking about inclusion, you were just talking about education. Well, not just, I'm a teacher. I think education is super important, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Whereas now you could be talking about business. You'd be talking about um, Julie and I have this discussion a lot, M managers and yeah. management in that creating inclusive settings um, that are accessible to a variety of different lived experience, right? Some that are less visible, some that are very apparent, but that are going on all the time throughout our lives. Mm -hmm. Inclusive and accessible spaces and, and processes are important everywhere. So yeah, I guess right now today I'm talking about procurement and yeah. tomorrow it might be about transportation. That's been another for me. <laughs> And yes. I think it's about an aha moment for people until yeah. they're, you know, we can think about it cognitively like, yeah, that would be a real drag not to get a, a taxi that was accessible to me in that moment until they hear people's life lived stories about some of that stuff and think, whoa, what would that feel like if I was in that situation? Mm -hmm. Often people just kind of leave it out there. So procurement to some people might sound really dry, mm -hmm. but to another person might be, um, you know, this is whether my business lives, lives, thrives, or kind of like yeah. peters out, or this is about yeah. to someone else, hey, I make a great product. And I am, I, I've actually inclusively designed it. I'm someone with lived experience of, of, of disability. I, I should be drawn upon and the valuing of um, so many different communities to actually get involved in that piece. So important. So it's a much richer discussion than just the technical aspects of what a what a thing is, is to teach or to procure or to yeah. transport. For the small business owner with a disability, procurement is huge, right? Accessible procurement, the, the ability to be able to do business with larger businesses in a way that you can, you can manage that's comfortable, that showcases mm -hmm. you uh, and doesn't make you fit right in the, in the mold of, of, you know, other larger uh, different organizations. So, yes. Okay. So we, we gonna, actually just oh, brought sorry. up a great thing. Daisy, yeah. like uh, if 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 we're if we're not even having processes, like you know, it's nice thing to say. Oh, we should have a, a diversity of vendors in our, our. You know, we should be drawing from a diversity of folks. If our mechanisms to do that are so cumbersome and so actually designed for maybe one small group of of, of people who have the time, money, all of those pieces, we're really missing out on a massive, massive opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And we're creating a huge barrier for sure. We are absolutely, and not supporting okay. local That's economy, really not supporting you know uh, national economy. It it just doesn't make sense. All right, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Accessibility Institute, Institute, which is a foreign kind of name to me. So it it used to be called the Read Initiative. So um, Julie, maybe you can share with us why why the change and and what maybe does that mean overall for the institute, and you know what was the thought process behind it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we were established about 10 years ago, unofficially though, on side of desk by one of our colleagues um, in the office. His name is Dean Melway. And uh, he worked in the Palm Etten Center for Students with Disabilities and saw this opportunity for more to be done outside of the need for academic accommodations for students. So Reed came to be as a bit of a side of the desk type of activity. And uh, Reed stands for Research, Education and accessibility and design. And so um, in 2018, when, uh, when I mentioned earlier that I came on board, Tara and I joined to do this large project for uh, post-secondary students with disabilities who are, are looking for employment, um, we received a very large grant at that point in time, and the university saw 
the value of the type of work that we were doing. And so they established us as a more formal unit. But I have to say that one of the challenges we had is a lot of people did not know what REED stood for. And so we were trying to describe, you know, you know, what it stands for and, and integrate it, but it just wasn't as obvious. And over the last five years, the work of the Institute has really grown and emerged and we have this greater vision. And so in uh, November, we celebrated our 10th anniversary, or I guess it was the end of October, our 10th anniversary uh, as Reed. And the president of the university uh, came to us and said, we really feel like we want to give you a name that more accurately represents uh, the work you're doing and where you're going in the work of accessibility. And so we were renamed the Accessibility Institute. uh, And we've just had so much um, great support from individuals, from organizations. I think it's much more clear to understand some of the work that we're doing. Uh, And as I mentioned earlier, not only are we doing the applied research projects, we're moving into education and training and consulting. And, uh, you know, we've got a few few different things on the go there. So we've opened the door for more possibilities. And it's not just here in Ottawa. Uh, And I know we'll maybe talk about uh, the Canadian Accessibility Network a little bit later. Um, But we've got this pan-Canadian lens to what we do. We know there's more uh, that needs to happen. And when we link arms, there's more more power together in that way. So, Well, you can launch right into the Canadian Accessibility Network conversation because that is my next question. <laughs> so, and, and again, that's, you know, near and dear to my heart because I've been involved since pretty much the beginning and uh, I've had, oh, I keep hitting my uh, knuckle on this light and so, <laughs> so I'm giving myself all kinds of lighting variations for the whole thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the Canadian Accessibility Network is, is near and dear to my heart because it is, uh, I got involved really early on in the process. So maybe share a little bit about what that organization is. And maybe I'd love to hear, too, your your rendition of how we started and where we are now, like, you know, some of the things that we've learned. And, and what I love is is that we've made mistakes and we've learned that as a community, as a group, and then we've made changes as a group. And now we're moving forward with a new path. It's not a whole path, but it's a new way to get to our, our, our ultimate goals. I'm taking all your words from you here, but, uh, but yeah, just share that with us. Cause I just, I just love the way that it's all kind of come together. Yeah, for sure. Well, just the same way that I talked about the fact that when Reed was side of desk, uh, Dean, who was leading it at the time, saw that there was there was room for more. Um, our current director, Boris Vukovic uh, of the Accessibility Institute, uh, had a, a vision as well where he saw that there was more we could do as an institution, uh, as Carleton University, not just here in Ottawa, but with this pan-Canadian lens. And so uh, in the early days back in sort of 20, late eight, uh, 2018, 2019, Boris, our senior management at the university and key players in government got together and they started talking about, you know, what more could be done. And so we saw there was this gap uh, across Canada. We know that there are experts in accessibility in many different areas, Mm -hmm. but there wasn't a place where all of those experts could come together and link arms and uh, really move to, to advance accessibility. And so in late December 20 or nine, November 2019, we launched what is now called the Canadian Accessibility Network. We affectionately call it CAN. And uh, CAN uh, is really this, um, it is a community of experts, professionals from across Canada representing public, private, not-for-profit, community service organizations, Um, Really, anybody who is moving forward, advancing, passionate about accessibility in some way, shape or form. Uh, The network has uh, gone through some definite growth. Of course, COVID, uh, we launched Mm. in December 2019 and COVID arrived on our doorstep in March 2020. uh, And we were still forming what the network was going to look like. And we were talking, do we do this in person? Do we do it hybrid? You know, how does it happen? And well, (laughs) you know, okay, online it is. And actually, (laughs) it was the best way for us to do it because our membership is across Canada. Not everybody has the ability to travel and to come to meet in the different areas. And so it's actually that was a blessing in disguise for our work as a network. Um, And so we, you know, we set some spent most of the first year sort of building the foundation of the network. 
So we started one way uh, and then we quickly realized after about the first year of working together that maybe there were different ways and we had unintentionally put in place barriers for mm -hmm. organizations and individuals to get involved and we had put in almost too much bureaucracy or process um, that was yeah. keeping people from being engaged and so as we've grown over the last couple of years our mandate hasn't changed it's still about linking arms bringing people across Canada who have a passion for advancing accessibility um, and it's also about helping us um, uh, really come together in a way that um, includes all the voices that should be at the table. Um, you know, I couldn't tell you exactly the number of people that are, are involved with CAN with lived experience, but I can mm. very confidently tell you that it's probably a close to, you know, 60 to 75% of our people, uh, you know, are, are at the table are bringing lived experience. So that excites us because we know that we're bringing all of these collective voices together. And we've got a few key areas that we're focusing our efforts on. Not that they're the only areas in accessibility that we want to focus on, but we've got, uh, we started as sort of working groups in employment, education, uh, and training, uh, research design and innovation and policy and community outreach. And of course, Deidre, you were our, our first chair of our community outreach uh, domain area. <laughs> Um, and uh, we quickly saw as we were moving along that uh, from a com community engagement perspective, actually, that it, it, it fed into everything that we were doing. And yeah. so, you know, uh, uh, over the last year, we transitioned from these small um, project based type of groups into a more broader community of practice where we removed the limitations to the number of people and the type of work that could be done uh, to opening it up to anybody from the network to come in and fly into any of the communities of practice in these areas and uh, to bring ideas. And so when we meet regularly, you know, we want to know what's going on and what's that pulse across Canada. Uh, you know, what's, uh, opportunities are there? Where are there gaps? Where do we need to have a collective voice and strength when it comes to informing policy? Um, we're having great conversations with, um, Stephanie Cadieux, our new, uh, chief accessibility officer, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and several others, of course, Yasmin LaRoche has been a huge advocate for us. And so really we're just uh, trying as a network to bring the community together uh, to take action and that if Boris, our director was here with us today, that was always one of the things he wanted. Um, it's sort of that for the people, by the people and to take action. To if we don't do want something. to be a group that just yeah. got together and talked, it's important. There's a time yes. and a place for talking. There's a time and a place for action. And and so we really want CAN to be that type of environment where people can come together and know that we're moving the dial forward. Doesn't happen overnight, though. There are some things that are going to happen for years because it's going to take a while, right? We're talking culture change yeah. and shift in mentality and mindsets in many ways. So, And, and such a large uh, animal to, to tackle too, right? It's so much. So it is going to take some time. Tara, you had something? I think, well, I think, you know, that's that, that, um, often when we talk about, even with employers, they'll bring up the idea of accommodation, you know, um, versus accessibility. So mm -hmm. accommodation is always a conversation, right? Like there's, you, you need to have dialogue about this. You should never assume what someone is going to require as an accommodation. And, and likewise, it's, you know, it's always this sort of conversation you're going to have. Um, oh, I can hear, there's a lot going on outside my window today. Sorry, I'm at home. Um, the other piece is um, that accessibility is a conversation. So uh, what I love about CAN is that it is about action. It's about pulling together. I loved how Julie said sort of that, that it's collective voice and sometimes really targeting that into places where we can make some, some collective impact and have pan-Canadian impact. And it can also do some deep dives where people have some areas of interest that they want to move things forward and, and get some things going and, and create some energy there. But it's always a, accessibility is a continuing conversation. You don't just yeah. get accessibility, you know, like it's yeah. always going to evolve. And so even can is an example of that, where seeing what, yes. how it's being functioning, now let's shift it again and let's move it. It's got to be evolving just as accessibility does. Yeah. And I was 
uh, as you say, Julie, um, chair of the Community Engagement Committee, and now community engagement has kind of been blended into all the communities of practice because each each area needs community engagement. And so now I'm a <clears throat> pardon me, I'm a member at large, which makes me feel like I'm I've got like a shady hat on and I'm in corners, you know. <laughs> I just have this visual of me running around as a as a member at large, like <laughs> here I am. No, here I am. Anyway, but uh so one of the things that I've been focusing on and 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 I think it's something that has kind of come naturally to me since I got uh, I first got affiliated with Ken was that recruiting aspect of it, like bringing other folks into the organization uh, and who else might have interest. And, and we speak at IWSCC, uh, and especially this year, you, you'll see a lot more folks that are coming by way of my introduction because uh, we're really focusing on our partnerships this year. Um, you know, uh, with our outreach to disabled suppliers in particular, but this also happens in the area of the veteran community, it's not always easy to find so our supply base. You know, with women entrepreneurs, there's all sorts of women entrepreneurial support groups. Uh, when it comes to disabled entrepreneurs, as far as we know, we're it. Uh, there are some government run uh, parts of community futures that support disabled entrepreneurs. But um, outside of that, you know, we, we keep talking to more and more organizations and everyone is like, no, we don't know of anyone else. So if you're out there and you support disabled entrepreneurs, we want to hear from you. Uh, and so the same thing with veteran organizations. Now, there are definitely more that support veteran entrepreneurs, but it is an area that uh, we really need to focus on. So uh, so something that I was really interested in was the recruitment aspect aspect of, of CAN. Uh, and so I'm just going to do a shout out right now. If you are interested in uh, working with CAN, you can reach out to me. Uh, my email address is on our website. It's daydreeg at iwscc.ca uh, or Julie or Tara. Actually, no, I won't direct you to Julie or Tara because they're not the right person anymore. We have a new person and she's fabulous. Um, so I will uh, introduce you to her. But we are looking for folks that are representative of northern areas. We're looking for West Coast. We're looking for East Coast. We have a lot of representation sort of from Central Canada, which of course makes sense. Uh, but in, from the northern areas of, of this country, we have almost no representation. And, and it doesn't matter if you're a one person. If you, you don't have to have a business. You can be somebody that's an advocate. You can be someone with lived experience. We want to hear your voice. We want to make sure that everybody's perspective gets included. And that's one of the things that I love about Ken because um, you know, I'm here, IWSCC, with our small organization, our little group. And also, you know, here I am on the same uh, committee with Ricardo from uh, Microsoft. You know what I mean? And so I was like, wow, this is so cool. Like, it gives you access to, like, so many different mindsets. So I don't know if you can tell, but I've quite enjoyed my experience with the organization. <laughs> so anything else that you wanted to share about, Ken, what, what we're doing moving forward? Um, yeah, I think at the, at the end of the day, we're still all about, you know, what does the community want and need? And, and so while Carleton University um, is hosting and, and sort of manages the national office that supports the network, uh, we're not driving the work of the network. And that's right. one of the things we're pretty, we're most excited about is, mm -hmm. is that we actually want the community across Canada to inform what's being done and and where we're going to go with it and what are the priorities and the needs and so we're just going to continue to be open to that we do a fair bit of project-based uh, type of work we're always looking for opportunities for funding or yes. applying for funding to support the projects and and the initiatives that the network is doing and so if anybody's got connections there I'm going to do a little plug for that yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know we would we, we definitely want it uh, we've got a small but mighty team of only about two or three people within the national office that are actively supporting the work of the network and right now we've got um, I think we're just about 70 or 75 yeah, organizations so. across Canada we've got about 150 members individually across Canada and we're looking to grow that because we just want that voice and so um, you know our focus in the coming year uh, is to continue to uh, grow the network, to move the dial forward. And we're doing some very specific outreach uh, in the federal and provincial governments in terms of um, building a sort of a, a sustainability plan and taking an active role in making sure that policy and, and what have you uh, is infused with the voice of the network as well. Nice. I think that's what's super powerful about it too, 
Deidre, you brought it up. It's having access to others yeah. who are doing work, maybe similar to yours, maybe different, but in that same space. And there's different times where you can link together to leverage that. There's other times where yeah. you can uh, do things that are just a, bit of, a little bit more sort of tailored to what you're trying to get from the network, but it's it's really it's I I would say, Julie, as I've watched it sort of evolve, it's it's growing to a place where it can be leveraged in that way, mm-hmm. like, and, and and you get something by being part of it, um, whether that's you know networking or an accessing someone that you might not normally have, have had ac- exposure to. From our point of view at the Accessibility Institute, too, you know, some of our projects that are like right now, we're we're involved with a really cool collaboration around housing. And, you know, I think there's going to be lots of voices from the Canadian Accessibility Network that have a lot to say about housing. Uh, So, like, not that the CAN runs our projects or projects run the CAN at all, just as Julie pointed out, it's, it's, it's informed by the members, but um, it's really neat to see some of those overlaps. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and it is the kind of community where we need to hear from people to get proper education because there is no place to go and get a course that teaches you this because there's so many changes and, and mm. so many, I don't even want to say changes, just innovations, a way to do things better. So many folks who experience life with disabilities, whether it's visible or invisible, are saying, hey, I also, this would also be great. Can we do this? And uh, this would be good. And we start to go, hey, that's actually going to make sense for a lot of folks and not necessarily just disabled people but and this yeah. is something that you know we talk about all the time in the world of accessibility is if when you're when you're sort of fixing things for what we might consider to be the outlier group i.e. those with disabilities you're actually making life a lot better for everyone within that circle as well and and i think when you know the general population starts to really understand that and move forward with that mindset we'll see a lot more changes and organizations like can are really you know helping to pave that way i'd love to learn uh, and share have, have you guys share a little bit about the forums that you're doing because I think people really need to tune into those they're pretty informative yeah you're talking about the can connect forums yes yeah for sure uh so one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that we were showcasing some of the amazing work that our members are doing across the network so pretty much every month every year or, or every month throughout the year we host what we call a can connect forum and we're bringing together members across the network uh whether that's panels on procurement we did one of those last fall uh so different people who are working in the area who can speak about that and you were you were one of our our first uh guests Uh, on that panel, Deidre, Um, you know, or whether it's transportation, whether it's post-secondary and the effects uh, of supporting uh, post-secondary students and accommodations. Uh, And there is a lot of focus on uh, sort of coordinated accessibility strategies. So really an opportunity for um, like-minded people to come together, to learn more, to deep dive, to build connections and and to learn from. Uh, Another key component of what we do within the network is really about building capacity. We want people to come to learn uh, and it to be a safe place for people to come and to engage and to ask questions uh, that they might not be comfortable asking in other environments and with an openness to learn and to approach things in ways that they might not have thought of before. So. Um, and I do want to speak to one thing because you, you mentioned that, that, you know, there isn't anywhere for anybody to go and learn about accessibility. And so I'm going to do a tiny little plug, if I may. Okay. Go, um, Julie, go. Yeah, because <laughs> so the Accessibility Institute is actually um, working on a new accessibility certification program. Nice. Uh, and so about a year from now, you will see a new program uh, that will be launched where there will be a series of different modules where we're looking at, we're still defining it a little bit more. So there'll be some core foundational courses uh, that you'll see for uh, sort of everybody and then specializations if people are wanting to focus in different areas. Uh, so we're really excited about that. We're, we're in the midst of doing some recruiting to hire uh, somebody to help us design and develop that program. And uh, you will hear more about that coming yes. out in the fall and, and winter. And we're lucky as an institute because we end up, you know, the work we engage in is community informed. So you know, that it, that's going to have a responsiveness to what we're hearing and having the can and having all the other pieces that we get to engage with. That's good flow of information and for us, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I guess it'll have to be something that sort of 
constantly innovating, uh, you know, on a regular basis, these, these certifications to make sure that you're, uh, uh, you know, up with all the latest, I said, I suppose, keeping up with the, the Joneses. So we're coming down to the end of this podcast and, uh, it's, uh, just before the Easter weekend. And so I know everybody kind of wants to get out of here, but I'm really enjoying this chat and I knew that I would. So I thank you both for being here. I always ask a question or whenever it seems appropriate. And I think today is one of those, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you found the two of you were on a beach, you found a, a genie, he popped out of the bottle and he said two wishes and they only are in the area of accessibility for Canadians. <laughs> it's the accessibility genie. I don't know if you've heard of them, but uh, <laughs> keep an eye, keep an eye on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> so in the area of accessibility for Canadians, uh, Tara, what would be sort of one wish that you would have for, for folks with disabilities or, or just in that specific area? In that sort of area? Yeah. Um, okay, well, I'll start with something just sort of a little abstract, but my big wish is that we get to a place uh, where we no longer see people as the other, mm. right? I think accessibility is going to continue to just expand and expand and be sort of baked into what we do when we stop thinking that, oh, that's another person I'm talking about. Yeah. So I don't create an accessible space for somebody else, whether I, it's actually me. Yeah. And you are me and I am you. And we are, our experience of this might look different. The reasons why we might need accessibility might look different. But frankly, it's all, it's for all, it truly is for, for ourselves that this yeah. is important. Uh, so that would be like, you know, if I could all of a sudden have that wish, it would be that everyone, we shifted that mindset from thinking about this is done for the other and, yes. and, and othering people who have particular experiences. Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that. I mean, I could get more concrete. There's plenty <laughs> as someone who's kind of worked within neurodivergent community for a long time. Um, there's lots of work I'd like to see there and, and even work for folks who are neurotypical to start cracking open those spaces. Mm. Um, I'm excited. To, I'm excited yeah, to, all like, there's stuff to learn. Amazing stuff to do. Yeah, right. And yeah. um, but. I'll, I'll leave it at my <laughs> having a mind shift. I had a, an aha moment, not that it was something brand new to me, but uh, a number of years ago, I was at a, a small group um, listening to a speaker. Uh, his name is escaping me now, and he is blind. And so at the beginning of his talk, he stood in front of all of us, which was maybe 50 to 80 people and said, okay, raise your hand. If you don't have a disability, never had a disability and never will have a disability. And of course, no one raised their hands. But the funny thing was uh, being blind. He said, I'm not seeing any hands. And so it was quite funny, but it made us all really go, uh huh. Actually, you're right. Every single person in this room stands a good chance of either already having a disability or at some point in their life living with one. And uh, aha moments are the best like that. That's something we re leverage a lot. And we talk about a lot in the Accessibility Institute. Yeah. I'm I'm big on that too, as a teacher, like those are the things we remember when we have an aha moment. So in a lot of the work we do, we make sure that those are in there. Like it's great to have, be pulling, we're pulling in best practices and we're, we're engaging and we're community informed, but part of pushing it back out there needs to have um, a bit of some potentials for aha moments for people. That's how you start to see culture shift and yeah, change. Exactly. Julie, you're on the beach. Uh, the genie is there. You've got your wish. In the area of accessibility for Canadians, what is it? Yeah, you know, Deidre, I want to say it's a little bit similar to Tara's um, in that I really desire uh, to create safe spaces for people uh, to have these continued conversations. A lot of the work that I've been involved in in this area has been with employers. And what we can hear continually is I'm open, but I'm afraid to have the conversation. Yeah. I'm afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing and then having some kind of human rights complaint against. And so they're yeah. then opting to not take action. And so I think my wish for the for the accessibility uh, genie would be that um, <laughs> that everybody knows that it's OK to have the conversation and that there are spaces and environments for people to have those conversations, to ask the questions. And it's okay that we don't know everything. Mm -hmm. I don't know everything. I'm still learning every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just, I really feel that that's important uh, for uh, the world. Uh, you know, I think 
we all need a place to feel comfortable enough to have the conversation. I agree, uh, Julia and, and Tara, and I, I'm, I'm so happy to have had you here today. Thank you for taking the time on a, essentially what's a Friday afternoon before a long weekend, except we do have the Friday off as well. So I really appreciate it. Um, and so, so good to have you here. Great to spend time with you too. This is, uh, it's, you know, we love chatting about this as well too. And it's, yeah. it's actually kind of a luxury to spend some time having these conversations Isn't about, it? you know, yeah. Yeah. You'll have Thank to you. listen to more of our other episodes. You're going to, you're going to love them. I, 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 there's one that, uh, we've actually released with Jade Pichette from Pride at Work Canada and I was editing it. And so Jade, I was, it's awesome. I know, aren't they? And so I was editing it and I'm, and it was, uh, you know, a weekend evening and, and my girlfriend's like, are you working? And I'm like, I'm just going to edit half of this. Well, I couldn't not only edit half. I wound up editing the whole thing because I just found it interesting and it's my own podcast and I've already heard it. Uh, but I just found it really interesting again. So there's some good podcasts out there. Uh, and that's not just for you, Tara and Julia, that's for all of you folks that are, are listening here today. And I want to thank you again for joining us. For more information about diversity and inclusion and supplier diversity, please visit our website at iwscc.ca. You can find us on YouTube. You can hear these podcasts on your favorite platform. Um, thank you again to Tara and Julie for being here and to Pod Supply for producing, Maple Communications for ASL, and of course to RBC for sponsoring. IWSCC's ASL for 2023. We'll see you next time.